Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today I got a little bit of a different video for you because I found this map yesterday in a news article. It was pretty interesting to me. Now, this map was created back in 2013 as a bit of an experiment by Alfred Twu, who's a transit advocate and a map maker and made this map to show what a possible future nationwide high speed rail system would look like in this country. Now, obviously, this map isn't anything official, but it has been going viral on Twitter recently, particularly with Zoomers. So I figured I'd put a video out giving my thoughts on the map and how we might actually go about making this map a reality. So let's start off by talking about things that I do like about this map that I, and that are based in reality. To start off with, we see that the California high-speed rail system that is actually under construction, and if you'd like to learn more about that, you can check out my videos right here. But you can see that line that stretches from Sacramento to Los Angeles to Anaheim to San Diego has been integrated into this map. And I love the idea of just extending this line all the way up to Seattle. It makes perfect sense. It would provide seamless connections along the west coast and i think it makes a lot of sense that yellow loop that goes from north out of san francisco i love that idea because it would actually make perfect sense it would cost a heck of a lot of money and they haven't really planned it into the station but the current trans bay transit center which i also did a video on if they just extended north out of that station and built another tunnel under the san francisco bay it would provide a huge capacity increase because terminal stations eat capacity and they're just not a good idea. So I love that idea. I think they should absolutely go for it. And also we see the line that stretches out from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That part of that line might actually start construction in 2021. It's being uh, currently pursued by Brightline West and they're trying to sell private bonds to actually begin construction on this line. So I really hope that that project moves forward. And again, if they could integrate that into the high desert corridor to link up with California high-speed rail, that would absolutely make this project very profitable if people could take a train from downtown Los Angeles all the way to Vegas. Uh, I love that. And if we go to the East Coast, you can see that they've included possibly the current Northeast corridor or maybe an upgraded future line, but we'll just assume it's the Northeast corridor. I'm actually going to do a video here in the future about the North Atlantic Rail Program, which would build a new high-speed line from New York City up to Boston traveling east out of the city onto Long Island and uh, tunneling under Long Island Sound. I think it's a fantastic idea, and I really would like to see it get built. Maybe it will get built. I don't know. We'll talk about that in the future. But anyway, as far as travel between Los Angeles and New York City, obviously, no, there's not going to be a ton of demand to do it. There probably would be some. And even if the top speed in the entire line was 220 miles an hour, Obviously, the train is going to have to make a couple of stops, like maybe in Chicago. So no, the average operating speed is not going to be 220 miles an hour. And given that it's 2,800 miles approximately between those two cities, the trip would probably last somewhere between 14 and 16 hours or something like that. So no, there's not going to be a ton of transcontinental traffic on this network if it were built out as proposed in this map. But there's a ton of cities in between <laughs> Los Angeles and New York, and there would be a ton of people riding to these cities if they could get there in just a matter of hours or minutes, I guess, <laughs> compared to what it takes to drive or fly currently with the systems that we have in place. And of course, the reason why we're even talking about this at the moment is because Democrats in the House of Representatives are currently drafting a $2 trillion infrastructure bill that would help create jobs, particularly green jobs, and transition this country into a more environmentally sustainable country going forward. <laughs> this map even has extensions into Mexico at Tijuana and Monterey, and a line from Montreal to Detroit and Canada. As for the line in Canada, I'm going to deflect to Reese with RM Transit, as he did a video about high-speed rail in Canada. But I'll just throw in a little tidbit about how a new road bridge is being built between Ontario and Detroit, and the majority of the $4.5 billion bridge is being funded by Canada. So when you see that America is turning to other countries to finance their own road projects, that's not a very good sign. So let's assume for the sake of argument that this new infrastructure bill sets aside, let's say, maybe $200 billion for high-speed rail construction. No, obviously that's not enough to build out the nationwide system that we see in this map, but we could get a lot of stuff built in the meantime and hopefully it would lay the groundwork for more funding to come in the future to fully build out this network. So I'm going to be making a lot of comparisons in this video to how the interstate highway system was built out because it was a huge nationwide program, it took like 40 years to build out. It was massively expensive, it wasn't always popular, and it completely transformed travel in this country. So any high-speed rail construction going forward is going to have to have strong support from the federal level. It's just too complicated, too expensive, and even though California led the way with high-speed rail construction, the project has not been perfect, we all know that, and it's, more importantly, not done yet, and it's there's no end in sight. Most of that is funding, but there needs to be more commitment from the federal level to invest 
and not just pull the plug out in four years when a new president gets elected. So the first thing that has to happen is there needs to be some kind of shakeup at the Federal Railroad Administration. The FRA is a heavily bureaucratic government organization, just is what it is. It's not very innovative or nimble like the FAA is with airplanes, and mostly what they deal with is freight railroads. That's their bread and butter, and freight railroads have changed a lot, but at the same time, they haven't really changed at all in the last 150 years. <laughs> so there needs to be some kind of organizational shakeup at the FRA that would establish a high-speed rail only commission or division or whatever you want to call it that would focus on federal oversight and management of high-speed high railway construction in this country and operation, obviously, once it's built out. But the FRA doesn't have uh, the staffing that it needs. It doesn't have the budget that it needs. And therefore, even though the FRA directly funds like Amtrak capital improvements, they, they don't have the money unless Congress gives it. And now once that high-speed rail commission is set up in the FRA, they need to adopt federal standards for how the lines are built, where they're built, how they're going to be operated, speeds, just a minimum framework of like radi curve radius and that kind of thing. The way that the interstate highway system developed minimum standards for how high highways would be constructed. Because a nationwide high-speed rail system is not going to work if you say when you cross the border from Ohio into Indiana, the speeds drop from like 220 miles an hour to like 100 miles an hour. That's just not going to work. We need a national framework for how the high-speed rail system will look and operate. Second thing we need to do to make this plan a reality is completely overhaul the highway trust fund. The federal gas tax has not been raised since 1992 and the highway trust fund has been limping along since 2010 with just incremental bailouts from Congress whenever they decide to get around to it and the system is just completely broken at this point. The way that the highway trust fund is supposed to operate is that they collect fuel taxes that would pay for road improvement projects. The federal gas tax is 18 and a half cents and the federal diesel tax is 24 and a half cents per gallon. And it's just not cutting it at this point. In 1982, the mass transit fund was created as part of the highway trust fund to fund mass transit programs in cities. But that has not created nearly enough money to create the transit system that this country really needs to operate efficiently and provide decent public transit in cities. So the whole system needs to have an overhaul and it needs more money. But bottom line is the highway trust fund needs to be overhauled and it needs to be set up in a way that equitably funds highway construction projects, transit projects, high-speed rail projects, and inner city rail projects. And it needs, it needs more money. We need to raise the federal gas tax, but we also need to explore other funding opportunities. Carbon tax credits are not very popular with anybody. <laughs> and, and it's becoming clear that it's pretty much already too late anyway. Even the American Petroleum Institute looks poised to endorse a federal carbon tax, which means that that's not gonna cut it. <laughs> if we're actually going to do, if we're actually going to get serious about fighting climate change, we need bigger systems and money's gotta come from somewhere. I'm not advocating taxing working class people or raising taxes on working class people. I'm advocating raising taxes on corporations that make a lot of money and people that make a lot of money. <laughs> it's just the way that taxes are set up in this country is not fair to the majority of Americans. And that has to change. We're not talking about that right now. <laughs> the last big thing that needs to happen with the Highway Trust Fund is that it needs to be automatically self-sustaining. Not raising the federal gas tax in almost 30 years is beyond ridiculous. It has to be able to pay for itself without just limping along, looking for handouts from Congress whenever they feel like it, and that system needs to change. So the third thing that needs to happen before America can build out a nationwide high-speed rail system is we have to get the states on board. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 gave money for several different high-speed rail uh, programs across the country, but three Republican governors canceled those projects in Wisconsin, Florida, and Ohio. And that can't happen. <laughs> I know that there's a lot of tricky legal issues involving states' rights and the federal government building stuff, so the states have to get on board. The best way I see fit to do this is the way that the drinking age got raised to 21 in 1986, and that is withhold highway funds. <laughs> 
Yes, Ronald Reagan, the small government demigod, even said that he was apprehensive about doing it, but he just cared so deeply about raising the drinking age to 21 that he had Congress mandate that states would lose 10% of their federal highway funding unless states raise their minimum drinking age to 21. So if it worked for that, I don't see why it shouldn't work with high-speed rail. (laughs) It's like, maybe Mississippi doesn't want to get on board and... You know, that's fine. They could just go without road funding. But I think once people actually see high-speed rail getting built out, there will be an increase in public approval, and people will actually want to ride the system. I legitimately think that the main reason why most Americans don't support high-speed rail is because they don't really understand how good of an alternative it is. Most people, when they think of trains in this country, they think of Amtrak, and Amtrak service is not very good. It's not high-speed. It's just needs help. But anyway, we need to get the states on board, and I think withholding federal highway funding is a great way to do that. And now the fourth thing. We need to get the states on board, but we also need the states to help build out and maintain the high-speed rail system. And the best way to do that is to have states involved in designing the system. Like I said earlier, there needs to be a federal framework for how the system will look once it's built out, But that doesn't necessarily mean the right-of-way has to be decided by the federal government. I think the biggest way to piss people off and make them want to fight the project is to have the federal government decide that we're going to build a high-speed railway through their town. So I think that it really needs to be left up to the states to decide the right-of-way and where they feel comfortable putting the line. Now that's not to say that the federal government couldn't tweak the plan, obviously. If the state wants to just make the line go way out of the way and slow trains down for no reason, that shouldn't really be allowed. But I think that there should be actual state involvement in picking the alignment. And as far as where the lines will be located, I think using the interstate highway corridors is a fantastic idea. The interstate highway system was very disruptive when it was built, but it did provide a lot of relatively straight lines across this country. And we can look at, say, the Bright Line extension between Orlando and Coca to see what this might look like. Now, obviously, it's not being built along an interstate highway. It's being built along Highway 528. But it is a good example of what a future nationwide high-speed rail system might look like. And picking a right away that displaces as few people as possible is definitely the way to go. Just ask California. (laughs) And now the fifth thing that needs to happen. Now the way that the interstate highway system is actually managed is that the roads are actually owned by the states that the roads run through. But construction and maintenance for them is largely paid for by the federal government. Would a nationwide high-speed rail system be managed this way? I'm not exactly sure if that's the best way to do it. Maybe. I mean, all, all 50 states already have huge departments of transportation that do nothing but build and maintain roads. So would hiring engineers that build and maintain railways be the best way? Or would it be better done on a federal level? I'm not 100% sure. I think it would probably be better to go this route politically because it would give states more control over the lines that they manage. That said, it would also give them more control to, say, not fund them as well, or yada, yada, yada. So there needs to be a federal funding mechanism established that would maintain these railways in perpetuity the way that highways and airports are maintained. So with all of that out of the way, will this map actually become a reality? Probably not. (laughs) I really want it to be. I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think it's totally awesome that young people that typically don't really think about infrastructure projects or have it in the past are getting excited about high-speed rail because it is exciting and it is definitely a goal worth pursuing. So I love all the enthusiasm that this map has generated. Now what do we do with that enthusiasm? I know this sounds incredibly cliche, but they are actually working on this bill right now. So call your representative or senator. They might not be very willing to listen to you, but you'd be surprised at how a small vocal majority can impact a huge amount of change if you're annoying enough, (laughs) basically. If you really want to learn more about high-speed rail in this country, you can sign up for the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association's email newsletter. You can get involved in other rail advocacy groups like the National Association of Rail Passengers or the Midwest High-Speed Rail Association or and dozens of co- groups like that across the country. You can watch more YouTube videos like here. But the main thing that will get people's attention is protesting. We all saw how much attention Greta Thunberg brought to the issue of climate change and how she kind of activated a whole generation of Zoomers to want to try and fight global warming and climate change. And I think it's wonderful. 
and high-speed rail is definitely a part of that. And not to go off on too much of a tangent, but the history of the interstate highway system is completely bound up in the history of race relations in this country. Interstate highways and cities were built through black and brown communities, and these communities were displaced with little to no compensation, so much so that there's even a saying of white roads through black bedrooms. The interstate highway system left a huge scars on American cities, and in some cases, these neighborhoods really haven't recovered even half a century later. So if we want to get serious about equitable, environmentally friendly transit solutions for this country, high-speed rail is definitely a part of it, and it needs to be done right. Cars have a lot of problems associated with them, and electric cars are great, but even electric cars and gas cars are expensive. And there's a huge cost hurdle associated with owning a car. You have to buy the car, you have to register the car, you have to insure the car, and you have to pay for gas or electricity in the car. So if somebody doesn't own a car, the only inner city travel options are buses, airplanes, and trains. And buses are not fun to ride in this country. Amtrak is only running three days a week on most of their routes currently. They will be going back to seven days a week sometime this year, but it's still one train a day is not good service. And for all of these reasons, high-speed rail is a social justice issue and it needs to be addressed. Because the more people start talking and thinking about high-speed rail and what a future with high-speed rail could actually look like, the more likely that it will become a reality. If you want to learn more about California High Speed Rail, you can check out the playlist that I made on it. And I hope you would consider subscribing if you like this video, and I will see you all soon.